Good afternoon and welcome to uh, the Chamber and Danville's 201 Housing Element Update. This is the Housing Site Suggestion Map session. Uh, we are going to wait for people to join and we will start in about a minute. Welcome. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Diane Friedman. I am the Deputy Director of Development Services at the Town of Danville. We are joined by the CEO of the Danville Area Chamber of Commerce, Commerce Judy Lloyd. We also have the Assistant Town Manager, Ty Williams with us today, David Crompton, who is Danville's Chief of Planning, and Kat Bravo, who is the Administrative Analyst in the Danville Town Manager's Office. We are very pleased to be here to be presenting this housing site suggestion map session. Um, Ty can, uh, or Kat, can you advance to the next slide, please? I'd like to provide an overview of where we are. Uh, we launched this housing element outreach process last year with the housing element 101. That is what I refer to as everything you wanted to know about the housing element, but were afraid to ask. And um, we have been really, you know, ongoing in this outreach process, trying to reach as many community stakeholders as possible. And we're very pleased to be presenting to our businesses because this is a, a very important process that we want our businesses to be in, involved in. So what we're gonna do today is we're gonna recap the housing element 101 we are going to talk about where we are in the community outreach process and then talk about what are the upcoming engagement activities, you know, how they inform the decision making process, what they are, how to use them. And then we're going to do a Q&A. And um, what I can say is that we have 2,241 plus reasons that we would like our businesses to participate in. This is a very important process as far as the housing uh, suggestion site. We have, to, we have to plan for over 2,241 housing units. And these units, where they're placed in, in the town will have a direct impact on our businesses. And we want our, our businesses to be partners in suggesting, in suggesting where these sites should go. Next slide, please. I'm gonna turn it over to Dave Crompton, our chief of planning. He's gonna go over the housing element, nuts and bolts, Dave. Uh, and Dave, I'm sorry, uh, before you start, uh, maybe we want to give Judy an opportunity to kind of uh, kind of craft it uh, a little bit for her audience as well. Should we do that? Sure. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Ty. Um, I think I probably know most of the people on this call right now, but just in case, I'm Judy Lloyd. I am your president and CEO of the Danville Area Chamber of Commerce. Um, and we are very interested as a business community in um, how and where the housing will need to be you know, constructed, where those units will go. Um, and so I just really want to encourage everyone who's listening in today, um, take advantage of this opportunity because um, in the end of the day, uh, we're under a state mandate and that state mandate tells us what we need to do as a community and take a minute to go through it if you can and see if you have ideas. Um, you know, this is, this is a great opportunity for community engagement and, and business engagement. So I just wanna thank the town, uh, you know, Diane, Kat, Dave, Ty for your time with us today. Thank you so much. Thanks, Judy. Thank you, Judy, and thank you, Diane. So this uh, housing element nuts and bolts is kind of a recap of sessions that we provided over the course of the last year and it talks a little bit about what a housing element is and what the um, what really the heavy lifts are that we have to have to work on as part of the update of our housing element. 
So next slide. So the first question you might ask is why do we need to do a housing element? And the answer is because it is state law and it's been state law since 1969. And it requires that every city and county in California come up with a plan called the housing element that shows how they are gonna accommodate their growth needs uh, for housing over the next eight years. Next slide, please. So what's in a housing element? So again, it's a plan to accommodate existing and project housing needs. It incorporates assigned housing targets that are given to us by the state of California. And a special note here that I wanna make clear is that the, the town of Danville does not build homes and we cannot force private property owners to build homes. So really what the responsibility is as part of the housing element is to um, have enough sites, enough properties in Danville that are zoned for residential use at a high enough densities, enough units to, uh, to meet our, our housing needs. And um, so that, that development may, you know, if we change the general plan on some sites, we may see some development occur relatively quickly and, and some of it may take years and years to actually um, develop. We have to do a housing element every eight years. And so this is the 2023 to 2031 eight year cycle for the housing element. And it's the, it's the sixth cycle that we've gone through in the state. What does a housing element include? It includes a plan, goals, policies, programs to, to and quantify the objectives. So basically it sets, sets in motion a plan for how we're going to accommodate our housing needs. It analyzes our existing housing stocks and our existing needs as far as different affordable levels and different types of um, housing communities or needs, you know, from seniors to disabled. And it evaluates the constraints that we might have currently in providing housing. And that's gonna be things like the cost of land and the cost of development or the lack of uh, vacant sites in Danville. And so this all gets down to the, the big lift here is identifying identification of sites um, to meet the needs. So next slide. So what is our need and how did we get there? It's something called the Regional Housing Needs Assessment or the RENA. And as we all, we all know, the state of California declared a housing crisis a few years ago. And so as part of this housing element cycle, the, the number of units far exceed, number of units that are being assigned to cities far exceed uh, what happened in previous cycles. So we, how we actually get our number, it starts at the state level, the so State Department of Finance and Community Development to population and housing projections for the next eight years and actually far beyond. They then uh, give, give a regional number to regional governments uh, to distribute among the cities and counties in that region. Of course, our regional government is ABAG. Then it's up to ABAG to come up with a methodology for how they're gonna distribute all of the units that they've been assigned amongst the cities. There's 101 cities, nine counties in ABAG. And you just can see here at the bottom, the number of units that was assigned to ABAG by the state about a year ago, a year and a half ago was 441,176 units at varying income levels to distribute. Next slide. And so this is, uh, again, the, our, our, our regional government is ABAG. And uh, when they got the numbers from the state, they went through a process with a methodology committee that was made up of members of different uh, counties and other stakeholders throughout the Bay Area. They spent about a year coming up with a methodology for how, the, how, how we should prioritize how and where the housing units uh, go, such things as should they, go in high resource areas where, you know, there's good schools and parks, or should they be concentrated in areas uh, where the, you know, housing hubs like in the South Bay. So have, you know, more of a, a jobs housing balance. And they did ultimately come up with a methodology. And next slide, please. And that methodology uh, for Danville meant a total of 2,241 units to accommodate in this next housing element, as I, as I described. And the 2,241 is, is a minimum number because the state also has a law called the no net loss law. Uh, and so because of concerns that sites might develop differently than we think they, or we've planned for them, we also have to create a buffer over and beyond the 2,241. 
And in some cases, they're asking for up to a 30% buffer, but there is some flexibility in what that buffer will be. Next slide. So this is just for a comparison. This is you see Danville's assignments and there are four different income levels, very low, low, moderate and above moderate housing units, total 2241 and around a thousand of those are low or very low. Basically what that means is that for the state, uh, we have to designate properties that are at least 30 units per acre to qualify as low and very low uh, income units. And so that's a, uh, one of the major constraints and one of the you know, major um, policies and you know, things that we'll be looking at at a staff on the council level to decide how we're gonna accommodate all those units. You can look at the other, some of the other cities, Concord has 5,073, down south San Ramon has 5,111. And the largest number in the county was actually the uh, unincorporated parts of the county under uh, uh, unincorporated county and they had 7,645 to distribute around in areas that are not incorporated cities throughout the county. So next slide please. And so we've been, uh, as was mentioned, we've been doing community outreach here for the last probably year and a half and we're now into our next phase of community outreach and engagement. So I'm going to turn it over to Kat Bravo. She's going to kind of walk you through our, our latest uh, engagement tool. It's been live now for, I think, about three weeks. And so, Kat. Thank you. So beginning last year, the town launched what it envisioned to be a multi-phase outreach effort on the housing discussion. The Danville Town Talk site was launched specifically to serve as our go-to information hub and be a two-way communication tool for community members to visit for all housing related uh, questions and to participate in activities throughout the process. After spending much of last year producing information for nearly every media channel we have, hosting webinars and taking every opportunity to present wherever we've been invited to, we have now launched into the next phase of community engagement. And this phase will consist of two parts. So the first part of this uh, phase launched with the housing site suggestion map, which I will demonstrate or, or walk you through shortly. Uh, during and following the close of this, tool, of this tool, staff will conduct analysis of all sites suggested against the state criteria. Sites that meet the state's criteria will be incorporated into part two of the engagement phase. And what part two is, is we will invite residents back to participate in a site-specific housing simulation tool called Balancing Act. Through Balancing Act, residents will be able to balance where and at what density housing can be accommodated to meet the minimum housing need allocation of 2,241. This data will be incorporated into the town's draft housing element, which will be submitted to the state for review in August. And when that comes back from the state's review, the housing element will be presented to the Planning Commission for recommendation to the Town Council for adoption. Um, so now I'm gonna give you an overview of the housing site suggestion map. Um, as I mentioned, this uh, tool lives on uh, the Danville Town Talks website. And um, so when you uh, open it up, um, you're gonna see this very zoomed out map. Um, you can see some pins have been dropped already. Uh, currently we have 96. And where you see these uh, bubbles with numbers, that just means as you zoom in and out um, in this particular area, there's you know, 15, 17, 16, four, three uh, pins dropped within that area. There are three ways to navigate the site. Um, you can you know, move it around uh, like, you know, any other map that you might go into, you can zoom in and out using the tools here. You can toggle to your current location um, or you can type in a specific address uh, to uh, go to a specific site. And um, so from here, um, you find a site, um, any parcel that you click on, you can get additional information regarding the site. And then when you're ready to drop a pin, you just go over here to the add pin, drag your pin to the site. And this uh, information uh, 
sheet will come up. So you don't have to be registered for the site itself to su successfully submit a PIN. You just have to provide an email and a screen name, agree to the terms, and hit submit. There are options to add comments or add an image, which we do encourage as it provides more insight into why a site is being suggested. Some other features on here, um, you can filter your, your map to show only pins you've put down, um, take away all the pins or whatnot. And then there is an activity feed, which is really great um, because it is a collaborative environment. So uh, you can see you know, where people have dropped pins, if they've, if they've added comments, what they've said, and then you can click to view to go to that specific site. Um, and then let's go back here. So um, in addition to being accessible on any desktop or laptop, the tool is also available on any smartphone or tablet. So this is great for if you're walking around town and wanna uh, access that, that way, uh, do it in person, you know, live in, in, in the moment. Uh, so there might be questions on what makes a suitable housing site. So while a, a pin can be dropped on any parcel within the town boundaries, it's important to note that there is a criteria that sites have to meet in order to be included in the housing element. So as you can see on this uh, slide, there are many laws that govern what makes a site suitable. And again, you know, you're not required as a public to know this. Um, our staff will be doing an analysis behind the scenes. Uh, so what are some things that you consider you can consider when suggesting a site? Uh, we encourage you to look at parcel size, um, existing use, and then transportation to act, sorry, access to transportation. Um, and then always take a moment to plug how you can continue to participate. You can subscribe to our news feed on the Danville Town Talks website. Um, you can, from this site, you can learn more about, you know, what the process has been for the town, what we've done, um, any legislation that's come through, um, or is pending, and then as always attend workshops. Um, this is our last one for 201, but we will be coming back with 301 uh, when the Balancing Act tool gets uh, launched. So we are happy to answer any questions that anybody may have. Diane, Dave, I see that there is a question in the chat about when the town plans to finalize their proposed site selections. I attempted to respond, but I can't seem to do it because it's an anonymous post. Maybe one of you might want to talk about the, the phasing and the schedule. Sure. So I think I can take that. So as you know, we've just been describing, we're currently we're trying to get the public input into the sites. And at a, at a staff level, we're also looking at sites. And we'll also be looking at these site suggestions to make sure they fit the, the state criteria. And again, the state bottom line is they won't let you just designate anything for housing if it doesn't have any likelihood of redeveloping. You know, if it's a if it's a viable site that's making money on its rents and it's newer, they're not going to accept that. So we have to look at kind of the older, less viable sites that maybe have vacancies and that type of thing. So um, once we do that, and we go through our next tool that uh, Kat also talked about, the, the uh, um, balancing act, where we're going to also um, ask people to start adding densities to sites to try to take all these sites and how would you, how would you balance them to get up to 2,241. Uh, and then by, uh, I think in July, um, we will have a draft housing element plan that at some point in that July period will become available to the public as a draft, just for comments. And ultimately, ultimately it needs to be sent to the state of California for a 90 day review, which uh, we believe will be between August and November. And then we will bring it back again to the, the town for public hearings in front of our planning commission and town council. So we hope to have a housing element adopted by early 2023. So Dave, uh, just to be clear, I think what I'm hearing you say is that the sites, the potential sites that might be available for the public's review would be this summer, is that correct? Correct, it'll be a wide menu. It'll probably, you know, hopefully it'll be more than um, the minimum so that there is some ability for the community and the, and the decision makers to kind of 
pick and choose a little bit and determine that you know some sites are better than others but um, we will have a, a draft slate of sites available this summer yes and and just to augment um the way the sites will be formulated is it's going to be heavily informed by the pins that people drop as well as an internal staff technical analysis correct that's correct okay. yes thank you um I see that there is another question, which is, can open space be rezoned to accommodate housing? Well, open space can be rezoned to accommodate housing. So uh, open space areas, number one, would require a general plan change from open space or um, other you know, parks and recreation to housing, to residential uses, um, probably not the type of redevelopment that we would be looking for. Um, a lot of the, a lot of the um, open space areas were created by clustering homes and, and preserving the hillsides and ridge lines and you know, those certain areas that we have a high priority in continuing to preserve. So it's not to say that there aren't any open space areas that are right along boulevards that seem to make a lot of sense that wouldn't really affect um, you know, activities and use and trails, that type of thing, but they're not generally uh, the sites that we are focusing on. And I think if I also hear you saying, uh, not all open space sites are all created equal, right? Some are private open space sites, like for example, owned by HOAs, and then, and then there are public open space sites with lots of conservation easements on top of them. So right. those ones on one end of the spectrum with all the conservation easements, with their development rights stripped out of them are probably less significantly less viable than let's say a private HOA open space site, correct? Yes, that's true. And, uh, and um, I would also mention that um, any any general plan change from open space to residential is subject to a, a, a law here in Danville called Measure S that would require a public vote um, to allow for that type of general plan change. So there's a lot of obstacles in the way of changing open space to uh, to residential development. All right, thanks Dave. Uh, we have a couple of other questions here. Uh, one of which is, can owners of commercial properties volunteer that they would be open to their property being rezoned as mixed use to help reach the required number of sites, even if they are not currently plans to switch to mixed use? So basically the question is, can, can they volunteer their own sites? Absolutely. Um, it, you know, it may, you know, we're going to be looking at, we're going to be looking at office and commercial sites that, you know, that are older and less viable and having the property owner on board, I think makes it easier actually to the state. The state will look at that and see that the property owner believes that uh, they do want to be able to develop the property so that it would be helpful. But again, it has to be a property that um, because of the age or economics of the property does have some um, likelihood or incentive to redevelop. And one way they can do so is to drop a pin on their own property, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Drop a pin on your own property and also send me an email so that we, you know, we know who you are and, you know, we can have a conversation when we get to that point. Dave, another question that has come through is, uh, is there a minimum density goal for the proposed sites? Well, for, for most of the sites, the minimum is going to have to be 30 units an acre because that's uh, what we need in order to satisfy the state that we're providing uh, housing that is potentially low and very low income housing. So 30 units an acre is what we'll be looking for on most of the sites as far as heights and, you know, going more than 30 units an acre. That's kind of, you know, what we're asking and that's what our, the next tool that we're going to be rolling out is going to help people with, you know, will help people uh, inform us on. Um, you know, we certainly in Danville, we've um, done a lot of hard work to make sure that all of our developments as they come through are in character with the town. And our general character has been 35 feet and uh, we have some three stories within the 35 feet. So, you know, do we want to go less acreage and go higher and more dense? and not have to spread it 
around as much or do we want to try to keep it lower which would mean that we would need to find more acreage so those are all things that we are uh, you know are questions that we are uh, throwing out there and trying to get feedback on yeah it is true at the end of the day that the big question right the million dollar question is do we go up more density so that we can save more land or do we keep it low but have to spread it out more right so it's up or out question so the another question is would neighboring properties of let's say uh, presumably the sites have any input on the size and the height of the structures yes i mean once once we get to the point where we are recommending sites we have kind of stripped down our list to the sites that we think we're going to be recommending to the council that they make the changes on for the development. There will be public hearing notices uh, that will go out to all the surrounding property owners for each of the individual sites. And while we we it won't make sense to us to do anything that's less than 30 units an acre, um, you know that the the individual characteristics of a property, how it relates to surrounding properties, and what have you. Are things that we do want to take into consideration and make sure that we um, you know get public input and that we you know that, that these all these projects are as compatible to surrounding developments as possible um, we have a comment in the chat that talks about the fact that or an observation that this is going to result in more commuters driving uh, to business centers and how does this gel with our climate action plan to reduce vehicle miles traveled I, I have a comment, but I figure you can you can start well, first. <laughs> well, yeah, I'm sure you can. Uh, you know, we've both been involved with this for a while, and that was really one of the main issues that we had with the with ABAG when they were going through their methodology for how to distribute the units, because we felt like they prioritized um, the suburbs that are what they're calling high resource areas over uh, you know city center job centers like. San Jose and, and Silicon Valley. And we, we in our appeal letter to ABAG, we made all those points that it's it's contrary to the our greenhouse gas emission goals. It's contrary to vehicle miles traveled and you know many other things. So um, I guess we have to say we agree with you. That's those are the exact issues that we have you know raised in the past. Yes, and, and just to underscore what Davis said, our the one of the cre key critical bases for our appeal was the fact that uh, Silicon Valley and certainly the business centers on the peninsula have underproduced housing, which have resulted in kind of the conditions that we have now, and that we strove to ask them to assign housing to where the job centers have been. And that unfortunately has uh, or had fallen on deaf ears. Any other questions? You know, I have a, a, a question, um, if, I, if I may. I don't know if we have any others in the Q&A right now. No, I don't think so, Judy. So it occurs to me that as you are developing your strategy to meet the housing element imposed by the state, at the same time, we're going to be looking at our downtown master plan, um, and I'm curious if what I'm curious kind of when's the last time we ever had these two major things come up simultaneously. Um, and, and I ask that question simply because it, you know we we all know that we need to evolve for changing circumstances and situations and you know the impact of technology, the impact of of uh, you know more people working at home. Um, I'm, I'm just curious, kind of, as we look at these things simultaneously, it, it, this seems like a lot for Danville <laughs> right now. It, it is a lot. And, uh, you know, it's just it's just the timing of, you know, things that happen in the world, I guess, because, you know, the, our downtown master plan that is existing, we did in 1986. So it was one of the things we did after incorporation. And it really did a great job of guiding how our downtown looks and how it developed over time. Um, but, you know, with the onset of COVID and now the, you know, hopefully aftermath and what we saw with the outdoor seating and, you know, the, uh, the atmospheres that were created and, you know, the people enjoying that, we, we felt like because of that experience, it's time to relook at our downtown master plan and it's, it's timely. So it's just, you know, 
it's just uh, the way that uh, things have kind of evolved. And uh, of course the housing elements are on the eight year cycles. And so their times and their due dates are set. Um, you know, as I said, I think our housing assignment of the 2,241 is about four times the number that we received in our last housing element, you know, in 2013. So um, even you know, with that, this, this housing element is much more of a challenge than any of the housing elements we've had before. And also to amplify, I think both of the, despite the fact that it's a lot for our little community to take in at the moment, they're both opportunities for us to shape our future, right? So as difficult as change is, uh, I, I always believe that if we're going to have to take the change, we should uh, embrace it from the standpoint of helping shape where it should go. So I think that's both the challenge and the opportunity for us. Let's see, I don't think I see any more questions in either the chat or the Q&A. Do you, Diane or Kat? No, and um, you know, just to revisit this, the opportunity that, and Judy, it was a great point and Ty, the opportunity that is brought up here is that, you know, our stakeholders, our community has the opportunity to weigh in on two very, very big, one of the biggest strategic uh, plans that we have as far as how we're growing housing in the next eight year cycle, as well as the downtown master plan. And you know, housing drives a lot of, of volume for businesses. So uh, that is very important. And you know, housing needs for the community and how we grow and maintain our character. So, I don't see any other questions. Does anybody else have any thoughts before we end the webinar? I just want to take a moment to plug that again on the housing. Uh, project page on the Danville Town Talks website. If a question does come up in the future, you can submit your questions on there. And again, it's a collaborative environment. So, you know, it's great for, if there's a question, there's probably somewhere else, somebody else in the community that has that same question and people can go and reference those. So definitely encourage you to go there. Okay. You know what, we, we do have one last minute question that came in. When do you think the first, um, Accountable House will be built, looks like 2024. I would say that's a pretty good guess. So we, we intend to um, approve our housing element and the general plan changes along at the same time as one package. So the general plan changes and the land uses uh, to make the land available for housing would be in early 2023. So for somebody to get moving and get permits and build, yeah, 2024 or later probably would be the before we see any housing units that are ready to occupy. Well, I there isn't a question that's being asked at this particular uh, workshop, but we have heard this one particular question quite a bit, which is what happens if the towns should just decide that we are going to produce a helmet a housing element that is consistent with our vision rather than the state's vision, what would happen? So the state um, over the years has passed a number of laws to let's just say encourage communities to develop and, and uh, submit a, a compliant housing element to the state. And they've, they've imposed a number of penalties uh, that could be applied to cities and counties if, if we don't. One is one is uh, fines of up to $600,000 a month for non-compliant housing element. Others are things like um, shutting down our, our building department so we can't issue any building permits, period, if we don't have a housing element that's compliant. And maybe worst of all, they um, there are laws that would allow for the state and the court system to do our planning for us. So if we're not, if they don't think that we're doing it right, we're not, uh, we're not coming up with a, a correct housing plan, then a uh, could be done by people outside the anvil that may not uh, may not be as good planners as we are. So that's that's uh, something that we want to avoid. Okay, so Diane, Kat, do we have a final ask of our panelists before we go? 
Yes, please go to our housing suggestion site and drop your pins. We're, we're looking at our pin counts. Uh, that is our ask. Please tell us where you think these sites should be. And uh, it's, it's very important that you spread the word. We, we want everyone along on this process and to be involved in part of the, you know, the suggestions uh, to inform our decision makers. It's a very important process and we're, we're gonna keep at it. And we, we thank you for joining us this afternoon. And just a, a quick question. This will be public, correct? This will be something that we can share. Wonderful. All right. Anybody else? Okay. Thanks, everybody. Have a great afternoon. All right. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.